some economic headlines about what America is facing right now from MSN.com. Salaries get chopped for many Americans who manage to keep jobs. This is like the lamest I told you so I've ever had. Like, did you, did you not see this one coming? Companies across the U.S. are cutting salaries as they fight to survive the coronavirus, upending a key assumption in modern economics and raising another hurdle to rapid recovery. The hard numbers won't be in for months, but anecdotal evidence is piling up. On the earnings calls, big businesses, including the Container Store Group and Lyft, have cited what they are saying, what they say are temporary salary reductions. Federal Reserve officials have also found plenty of supporting evidence. The pandemic has triggered unemployment on a scale not seen since the Great Depression. Pay cuts for Americans who have managed to hold on to their jobs may hobble the return to normal. People will have to use a bigger chunk of their income for fixed obligations such as housing and other debts, leaving less for the kind of spending that can help spark the economy back into life. As Michael Gapin, chief U.S. economist at Barclays PLC in New York, says, it's one of the reasons why we don't expect a so-called V-shaped recovery. Pay cuts might have little and in some cases maybe nothing left over. Excuse me, Americans taking pay cuts might have little and in some cases maybe nothing left over after that for discretionary purchases. So this is a you know a tough time for everybody. Like they're just there's no way around it. You can't lose this much of the economy to a force unemployment crisis and not have massive repercussions as you can see in this graph there's a pretty uh pretty significant sudden drop off for the aggregate weekly pay 11 percent in april the most on record pretty dramatic right and so there there are the uh phenomena here that we're calling into question in the article is under the headline not so sticky that's not supposed to happen according to ideas that have dominated economics for the better part of a century since john maynard Keynes unveiled his famous general theory during the great depression the phenomenon is known as sticky wages employers may be able to cut inflation adjusted pay by raising wages less than prices the argument goes but it's harder to cut pay in nominal terms in other words by putting a smaller number on people's paychecks. That's why supply and demand get out of balance in a slump, according to the so-called new Keynesian model that Fed officials and other policymakers lean on. <laughs> it's a justification for governments to intervene with stimulus rather than just allowing market forces to play out until the economy finds a new equilib equilibrium. And so it's great, even in this mainstream article, we're seeing at least an honest assessment. I mean, this is the most honest part, like, you know, I, I feel like the, the, the author of the story is like working their way to, it's all scam, right? That's why the new Keynesian model, this is the, according to the so-called new Keynesian model that Fed officials and other policymakers lean on. It's a justification for ripping you off. It's all a scam, you know? And, and even to, to have it sort of like hinted to in a mainstream article like this, is pretty cool and that keynesianism itself is being challenged like it, it took us what since uh, you know most of a hundred years to go oh hey yeah having the government print money in a crisis is you know yeah yeah uh, we we can't just and it's not it's not like we as a species just realize it's way more accurate to say we figured out the racket that we figured out that this was a scam and that's why like, I am, I'm really excited to see this increased level of awareness. While Congress has authorized some $3 trillion of fiscal spending, Fed, Fed Chair Jerome Powell has warned that measures taken to date may not be enough to prevent widespread bankruptcies and prolonged joblessness. Now, this is, this is the guy, like, we, we just, Three trillion, another three trillion, three trillion. We're at nine trillion something right now, right? I mean, these numbers are just so big and abstract as to be irrelevant. 
I'm, I'm basing this because I saw there was there was the first stimulus that was about three trillion, and then there was another one, and then in between there was an injection of three trillion dollars of liquidity into the banking system. There are probably other like lots of other data points. I'm not incorporating in this because like I, I don't care to study the knife in my back when I can focus on getting it out. And so Jerome Powell saying that this might not be enough is an admission of the fundamental failure of the system to be able to say, hey, you know how you know how we we have this system where the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer, but our justification for it is that it's necessary to keep you happy and, and keep your jobs going and keep the supply chains going and, and keep the grocery store stock. Well, yeah, we can't keep up the solution any longer. It, it's, yeah, sorry. Um, I guess, you know, we might have to give up part of it because the American people are figuring out like, and how can we, how can you not look at this and be like, how do we put up with this shit for so long? Well, I mean, Jerome Powell, like just, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, we're doing we're doing all this stuff that's ripping you off, making it harder for you. It's not working. Um, but for now, uh, what do we need? Mm, uh, just just another three trillion dollars, if you don't mind. The pandemic exposes the shortcomings in the new Keynesian model, according to J.W. Mason, an assistant professor of economics at City University of New York. The real takeaway from Keynes is that pay cuts only drive the economy further from, not closer to, full employment. The source of unemployment in a crisis like this is a lack of aggregate demand. He said, pay cuts are only going to make that worse. More economic headlines to roll into this segment. Everyone is shocked. CBS News hit hard by layoffs. This is from HollywoodReporter.com. And I mentioned, you know, the challenges here for uh, for independent media, right? I mean, even for us, like anything about for political campaigns, if you're not sure if you're going to have a job next month or if you're going to get a pay cut, you're not donating to political campaigns. What this does is it, is it has a huge effect, a uh, deleterious effect on the balancing value of grassroots fundraising efforts versus grass tops, corporate assholes, bribing politicians, fundraising efforts. And so the consolidation of power towards Donald Trump and Joe Biden at the expense of grassroots candidates like Libertarian Joe Jorgensen. Obviously, we're going to be at an even bigger disadvantage this year as Libertarians from the top of the ballot to the bottom of the ballot are going to have challenges funding their races. Independent media like us, you know, I'm really grateful for YouTube as the mechanism by which you're able to give us a super chat and for as little as a dollar jump to the top of our comment stream. I, I'm, I'm grateful for Patreon.com that people are able to subscribe and, and support the show and that we're able to to build something right now independently of that. But this is something that we know is harder than it's ever been even for us, which makes us all the more grateful to have an active and engaged audience supporting what we do here. And I, I, well, I mean, I, I'm kind of like, you know, a little bit of the schadenfreude in me is tickled by the CBS story. Like, <laughs> oh yes, yield corporate media and your fragile, models dependent on this old system yeah did, did did your did your banking overlords forget to include you in this shakeup now like are you are you getting cut out of the big racket well excuse me for gloating but after having established adam versus the man so well in the sort of golden age of of internet independent media and then getting demonetized and censored so much over the last few years. Ah, uh, mm, yeah. Mm, I, I, yeah, world's smallest violin playing for every mainstream media outlet going out of business due to coronaphobia. CBS News was hit hard by a round of corporate cost cutting that saw a single digit percentage of the network's news staffers laid off, according to an estimate given by network president Susan Zarinsky during a Wednesday afternoon all hands conference now i kind of want to get out the whiteboard again here i'm going to do it you know if i say that i'm going to do it because the layoffs are you know something that happens as a consequence and I, i'm going to draw the cliff here okay you know that like if, if employment is is kind of trucking along and then falls off a cliff right and this is the point and, and yeah it's it's not a perfect vertical i get it but it, 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 you'll see where I'm going with this in that when employment is trucking along, there's a sudden vertical drop off when government shuts down 
bars and restaurants and other non-essential businesses where it's just like, oh, you had a job? Sorry, not anymore. Especially if it's tips based, strippers, bartender servers, especially affected by this. But then even here, there's a tumble effect, you know, where, oh, all those people lost their jobs. Well, now I have to lose my job and I have to lose my job. And I have to, so there's this cascading effect that, uh, of, of unemployment that we're still experiencing as a follow on to this. And CBS is kind of downstream from that, right? Like when, when, when we fell off the cliff up here, CBS didn't go, they, they didn't have to let off anybody, right? They still had advertiser contracts. They still had cash on hand. But now that we're here and they're going, oh shit, this is, this is our advertisers laying off people who aren't restaurants and bars. And that means now our revenue is going to come down and they're going to have to adjust to that. And it's finally when it gets to here, you get to the point where CBS goes, okay, shit. Time to lay people off. And even if the recovery from this kind of creeps up, for companies like CBS that are responding to this decline, there's going to be a whole other wave of pay cuts and unemployment following from this that we need to be looking out for and no matter how much money they print these mechanisms of building these these organizations back to get these you can't just you know the the, the myth of the v-shaped recovery was well we can just you know we just have a sector of the economy where it takes some time off and and then get back to work and everything will be back to normal right it's like no no we're not that smart we haven't we haven't set things up that well yet you know, we don't have the insurance mechanisms in place. We don't have the organization in place. We don't have, and, and even now, just because we have government, we don't have the ability in place to compensate, to adjust, to adapt and overcome because we still have to deal with government regulations and enforcement of taxes, and, you know, all of this stuff. Based on the size of the news network, which totals more than 500 staffers, Employees did the back of the envelope math and estimated that about 50 staffers were cut, though the network has not specifically said how many were affected. So the next story from AJC.com, another important economic data point coming from Hartsfield Jackson Airport from the manager, full airport recovery could take two to five years. So the uh, Hartsfield Jackson International Airport is starting to see a slight uptick in passengers amid the coronavirus pandemic, but a full recovery could still be years away. Airport General Manager John Selden told an Atlanta City Council Committee Wednesday that gross revenue from concessions and rental cars at the airport declined by nearly $42 million in the January to March quarter compared with the year earlier. The decline reflected just the first weeks of the pandemic. Again, cascading effects. People being afraid to travel means people are going to fly less. It's not just the airlines, it's the airports. It's all the downstream businesses that are connected to concession at the airports, to retail at the airports, it, and on and on and on. The economy is not you know, a machine with levers that you can just pull and operate and swap out at will. It is a far more complex machine than anybody could possibly centrally plan. And to hear them actually going to the Atlanta City Council, like, oh yes, turn to government. And, 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 I, we are suffering because we have allowed government to control so much of the economy that even coming back from something like this, when the American people, we are generally ready. I mean, most people are comfortable going back to restaurants with no precautions already. And, yeah, so would I, you know, if I had a reason to go to a restaurant, wouldn't hold me back at all. And you would think, that you know it would be obvious i hope it's obvious by now but that we have the why does why does flying suck like what what well there's a ton of government involved no shit. first of all hello tsa it's not that we shouldn't have security or accept that hey security just has to be this way no it's because of government if airports were handled or airlines were handling security or private airports were handling security it would be fine why are airports such miserable experiences with parking and traffic and loops and bad signs and getting lost? It's got, you're driving around a government facility. Duh. 
And if it wasn't for the government monopoly on airports, and it's not a perfect monopoly, I know, but enough that they have a quasi monopoly by licensing and having the biggest commercial airports are all government airports. Well, gee, well, why do you think that happens? You know, there's, 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 a, there's a racket here to pour, you know, millions of tons of, of, of cement and, and, and all over these, these buildings, these monstrosities. If airlines were forced to pay for it, for airports themselves, they'd be smaller, local, way more convenient. You'd be able to drive up to the airplane and and, and park and walk from the parking lot to the plane, and there just it would be the, the convenience would be unreal compared to what we have today. It, like why why like that airport lounges are even a thing, uh, and then the oligopoly of the airline industry itself that it, it makes it way more difficult for any corporate uh, competition to come in. And, and edge out any of these existing businesses by providing better service to customers. You can't do it. Why Why does flying suck? Because of government. Ugh. Like, and so anyway, to the story, since then, more concessions have suspended operations. About 310 of the airport's 347 concessions are now closed. After the airport shuttered concourses B and E and parts of concourses C and T in response to airlines cutting as much as 85 percent of their flights passenger counts declined as much as 97 percent at the lowest point in april but have recovered slightly to about an 88 percent decline year over year we expect this to continue as people feel more comfortable traveling selden said but when so he says next year maybe we'll be at half the level from before the pandemic I hope that's not being too optimistic. It could be. So finally, in our economic news today, from tunesnanews.com, an avalanche of evictions could be bearing down on America's renters. Again, just another huge tragic ripple effect in all of this. The United States already wrestling with an economic collapse not seen in a generation is facing a wave of evictions as government relief payments and legal protections run out for millions of out of work Americans who have little financial cushion and few choices when looking for new housing. The hardest hit are tenants who had low incomes and little savings even before the pandemic and whose housing costs ate up more of their paychecks. They were also more likely to work in industries where job losses have been particularly severe. Temporary government assistance has helped, as have government orders that put evictions on hold in many cities, but evictions will soon be allowed in about half of the states, according to Emily A. Benford, a housing expert and associate professor at Columbia Law School, who is tracking eviction policies. We are just beginning to experience the repercussions of this. You want to talk about a second wave and a third wave and a fourth wave? It's not the virus. It's the wave of spasming government that hits over and over and over again with consequences from the economic shutdown and the economic manipulation that is consolidating wealth and power extremely effectively. The first wave is the forced unemployment crisis. It's like the first layer. This might be like the seven plagues, right? First, we have the unemployment crisis. Then we have the retail crisis. Then we have the corporate layoff crisis. Then we have the eviction and homelessness crisis. Then we have the real food crisis. And then we have the final government crisis, a full takeover of the economy. We can't let that happen. We can't let it get to that point. I don't think it will, but do not underestimate the plague of government economic intervention that we are experiencing right now.